and we hope you've enjoyed the series so far, How to Engage with Cyber Policy, um, Tools for Human Rights Defenders. Um, the series was um, really designed to help equip um, activists around the world with messages and about the actors, issues, and forums um, that you can engage in and provide you with the sort of foundational knowledge needed to be able to effectively engage and really start shaping the discussions. The policy being human rights by design. Um, and you know, debates will differ from country to country. Um, we hope that these videos and these QA sessions will provide a starting point for all of you to kickstart debates um, on cyber policies that support and promote human rights and security together um, in your countries. Um, this series um, is, has been open to all and will feed into the in person training component. Um, part of the overall cyber capacity building training program that we've been doing here at GPD. Um, this webinar itself is a chance to think clearly on the key issues and avenues for engagement outlined in the Africa video, um, which I hope you've seen, um, and that aims to really provide a solid starting point to craft um, the advocacy approach um, to similar questions you may have about the queues in the in the region and, and how to get involved. Um, hearing your questions about the priorities in the region, ways to engage, and that the regional track will then be built upon in the in-person to build um, a sort of coherent regional strategy for engagement. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Grace, um, Gassai, who is our um, moderator today. Grace, you want to take it away? Like uh, Aditi has said, uh, the objective of this uh, session is really to gain clarity on key issues and avenues for engagement, as outlined the African video. And we are hoping that you have actually uh, watched uh, not just this African video, but series of videos on this topic that uh, G has been producing with uh, with the of other stakeholders, um, I deal with a starting point to start crafting an advocacy approach on how to safeguard human rights in the cyber policy. So to start off, we have um, two panelists, uh, Emila Vusche from APC, we have Moses Karanja from Strathmore University, Nairobi, and Enga, uh, I can never pronounce name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Paradigm Initiative Nigeria. And that just as a as a way of kickstarters, I'd like um them to just give us their no one one sentence, one minute. But I'll start with Ben Benga. Hello Zoom. Uh, I'm I'm Initiative Nigeria and two key areas of interest that's uh, digital inclusion and digital rights. Uh, digital rights meaning talking a lot about cyber policies but a strong focus on internet freedom or digital rights uh, on the continent. Uh, thank you to Global Partners for hosting this uh, discussion. Um, I'm Emila Oshe and I work for the Association for Progressive Communications in the Africa Policy Team. Um, and um, um, my interest really is everything related to the internet. Um, and APC is, um, is a global of uh, the membership based organization, and we really don't just get excited for the sake of getting excited about the internet, but really want to use it to ensure that um, there is justice in the world. Thank you. Thank you most. I am a research fellow at Strathmore University in Nairobi, where our focus is to bring qualified uh, evidence on the conversation table so that when you advocacy, organizations or government policy making bodies or whoever that is at least they can be talking from a point of knowledge and not just a point
point of our opinion. So this is uh, why this is very interesting for me. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the next one also. Much uh, to our panelists, and we go straight away to our first uh, question, uh, which is perspective. Uh, um, uh, I know the three of you have been working very closely with policymakers in, in your different regions, and perspective policymakers. Uh, what do you think are the main priorities in cyber policy? You can pick that question. Maybe because of. So for for policymakers, I think it, it's really critical to look at what a trend is. Uh, one of the recent trends that we've seen across various countries, uh, if you use including citizen rights, uh, so you've seen things around internet shutdowns, um, you've seen things around it, uh, not just internet shutdowns, but also in, in terms of privacy, so there's one in terms of internet shutdowns, either you know that is suppressed somehow or not strictly spoken against in existing laws. Uh, there's the privacy, but there's also the general um, where you know people are beginning to have conversations around the need to protect users, not just to have advocacy when someone gets arrested or not. You know, uh, proactive conversations about what are the rights of, of citizens online. I think, you know, generally of interest is the concept of freedom of expression. Uh, and I don't want to say freedom even after expression. Um, you know, example, we've had scenarios just just if you go actually in Nigeria, we had a scenario uh, of a blogger who was picked up because of content that he shared. Online, so this is this is an area of interest because there's still disconnect between uh, people who interpret um, and the real meaning of the law. And one one piece of this of this is the cyber crime laws in many countries across Africa. So we have a scenario where um, in the Nigerian cyber crime law, for example, Section 24 talks about cyber stalking and a COG agent then treats someone who says something against the government of people as having committed the offense of cyber stalking. Don't forget that stalking means it's a repeated offense, but in one incident is then interpreted um, as cyber stalking. So these are some of the issues in terms of, I mean, beyond access, which is a general, you know, general conversation across the continent. There's, there's you know, issues of data privacy. There's lawful interception, uh, the, you know, things around shutdowns or government surveillance, also in terms of citizen, you know, freedom of expression. You point out a very interesting issue, the issue of surveillance, and uh, you brought in also the component of bloggers, uh, where we are starting to see our jurisprudence or its attempt, its attempt you know, to test people for expression. I don't know if uh, um, of the panelists want to add something, or should I move on to the next question? Good. Uh, take something that I've, that I uh, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Grace, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very clearly. Yes, we can. Okay, okay, great. So, um, I think uh, the question of economic focus, we have policymakers, especially in government. If you can get most of the policies and the laws, even multilateral agreements. African Union Convention on Rights and the Comet region. All information security. The, uh, the issues of citizen rights around the internet, in the internet, you know, observe, not something that was uh, uh, from the start. Number two, a uh, thing that I've also, we have also, uh, is child safety. Probably closest it comes to human security online and and, and the question of the hosting uh, so that you have over the places that in the form of Facebook, WhatsApp and all these kind of things located and raise the data. You can 
see the uh, conversation starting around we uh, sovereign states or how that agreement will come into when the states need to secure this data or they need to access that data. So that's something that, that also ties in very nicely around information control, what we talked about, about internet shutdowns. Increasingly, you can see this uh, spectacular case being upon, which is having they have a, an internet curfew where internet is switched off around 7 p.m. and around 10 a.m. So uh, this is a, a, a kind of thing we can, you know, uh, work continue. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Moses. Um, as somebody who's been working a lot in human rights, you know, you're in the human rights movement, um, human rights and the internet. Um, would you have something to add on to this issue? Uh, I'll just add what uh, Benga and uh, Moses have just talked about. I think some of the issues that we are seeing um, is the militarization of the cyberspace. And I think Benga has already mentioned that uh, cybersecurity is being increasingly brought into the security agenda of um, African states. Uh, being the army, uh, the defense forces playing a huge role in terms of um, uh, security lines. Uh, we have some countries actually having cyber deaths or cyber commands in, in, in their defense units. Mm -hmm. And um, this just shows that the internet is becoming uh, increasingly militarized. We know that a few weeks ago, uh, one country in the southern uh, in Southern Africa, um, the army issued a warning to, you know, like social media abusers and, and all that. So, so it's something that we, we are also uh, seeing. And I also want to just point out uh, cyber security and censorship. Um, what I what is re re is that um, cyber security is being used to introduce and legitimize uh, censorship. And in that case, actually, using such censorship, uh, we see our government um, to protect children. Moses has already mentioned this, and to protect women. But we know what happens uh, to online political speech, uh, and also to to free. And this is just uh, is used to spy not just on citizens but also the human rights uh, defenders. So th those are the two issues that I would just bring on the trends that we are seeing in terms of security. Thanks a lot. Uh, very useful information coming from you. Um, I would like to move on to the next question, and which is, um, uh, we know that internet, or we have, we in, in, in civil society have been saying that internet is a right for and a must, and, and everyone needs to have it. Why is there inequality in Africa? You know, is it a case of uh, accusation that there's a lot of spam, especially, you know, Nigeria being accused um, of generating lots of this spam? Um, we start with Benga. <laughs> and spam and scam in one sentence. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things you have to deal with. You know, it, it's interesting. What 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 is even the fundamental reason for equality? Um, you have as much to do with scam and spam as with the mistakes we've made we laying the foundation for internet access. And, and forgive me a bit if I was back a few years into when we laid the foundation for internet access. Don't forget, telephone in Africa was literally non-existent for landlines. That means that we we refuse to do the groundwork in terms of terrestrial infrastructure. So when mobile phones came, we jumped on mobile opportunities, we jumped on mobile you know, access, mobile broadband. But there's a problem between mobile, which has its own limits, um, and also don't forget the fact that the more the networks add on people, they don't add as much capacity because they want to make as much money as possible. And so because we failed in terrestrial infrastructure, when I say we failed, I mean we a lot, of, a lot of cables at the ports, we let a lot of clothes uh, in Lagos and other ports across the coast, 
but we refused to do the groundwork in terms of last mile. We did not connect, you know, a Lagos, for example, to a, you know, uh, somewhere in the interland. And because of that, we relying on more internet, which unfortunately is falling into people's profit and basically, you know, sell you they call to MDPS, which basically plug and play. You know, you plug it and you start playing instead of plug and, you know, plug and play uh, internet. So I think infrastructure is one of the of the basic reasons. So there, there, there are a few countries who have gone ahead uh, to you know develop policies, invest in structure and do other things like that. So because of that, we've got a few countries that have scenarios where in the cities we have a lot of infrastructure and better access and then you know in the interland you you don't have as much uh, access. I think, you know, I, I want to focus a bit more. Maybe, maybe I'll come back to this later, you know, uh, after Emila and Mose have also said a few things. But I think I would like to look a bit more at the infrastructure mistake we made. Uh, one, of, one of the things I say about Nigeria is that now that Nigeria has a broadband plan as many other countries across the continent, there is an opportunity to make broadband the new GSM. And by that, I mean that in about 2001, we had a scenario where people said, oh, there's inequality. Uh, in mobile phone distribution, as we now have for internet, uh, but thanks to liberalization and market participation, um, the conversation around the fact that the poor can't pay for mobile phones is not a dead conversation. It's the same conversation we're having right now. Can the poor afford, you know, reliable bandwidth and things like that? But I think we have an, an opportunity to repeat the the happened a few years ago for for mobile phone for broad. Internet, uh, on the continent. So I think infrastructure and the mistakes we made in terms of, which is obviously the reason why everyone and their cat and dog is now trying to come in quotes to Africa uh, to give us better or free access because we didn't do our own work with infrastructure. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is that, that last sentence is um, is, is from Benga. Thank you, Grace. Yes, I was speaking with my mic off. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. I, I think Benga has raised um, a very pertinent point there, but I think um, focusing just on infrastructure alone uh, is not a solution um, to create. I think increase access to infrastructure should be coupled uh, with efforts to address political, economic, social, and cultural barriers. Uh, that prevent people from fully accessing the internet. Um, we know as women, we do have our own barriers. Young people do have their own barriers. And those who are less able, so so there there is need for um, integration in terms of how we approach internet access in Africa and to defeat inequality as a whole. I also think policy in itself is interdependent, uh, and there. Are sectors that actually limit access to the internet and this include um, <coughs> limited um, supply. Uh, we know in so many countries uh, it's to have uninterrupted power supply. So if uh, access in itself is cheap, uh, you don't, if you don't have the power to even charge your cell phone or laptop, then it becomes a problem. So then that needs to be dealt with. Basic ICT literacy, sufficient applications, local content, and I also think we need the, the government and also civil society we need to, to put uh, public access on the agenda. Not everyone can afford to have their own device, uh, and libraries and other public spaces do have a role to play in, in ensuring that. Uh, there is uh, equality, there is, uh, you know, people can actually go to, um, to, to access. Uh, and one last point there, uh, Grace, is that um, mobile in itself is not enough. Um, and talking about um, the mobile phone, um, you know, in South Africa, right, we have all these other things that people talk about. In, uh, in, but uh, I think it's not enough. Uh, we need to deploy low cost 
locally on the twenty four. Uh, and two things about cost. The internet access is still very expensive for most people, and so for me, coming from Zimbabwe, most people actually do not afford to play, you know, to to access the internet. So um, it's still quality access. It's an uh, uh, and we need to prioritize ensuring that the cost of the internet is lower. Some reason um your volume went very very well. add anything or should I move on to the next question? Uh, you can move on to the next step because I think both supply and demand aspects uh, to the internet access have been covered. Uh, so there's some uh, just one point about digital skills and the ability to actually the internet. It's one of the leaders of to, from whatever it's being supplied from to the people. So when people can actually use the internet and can actually, uh, you know, tinker around with it, somehow they will be the most connected sections of population. So if we can track how our populations are acquiring those skills, and this is the question of uh, in horse, what came first? We cannot learn computers without or internet without having the internet. So it's a bit antagonistic there, but if we understand the trajectory of digital skill acquisition, then we can somehow understand why some sections of population are using the internet. While we think the same population, we have some people who are not using can help explain some of uh, the separation between these populations. That, those are just, that's my minor point there. Great point. I think also something about uh, infrastructure that both Emila and Ben uh, emphasized on. Um, I think also the issue of uh, that lack of infrastructure in in uh, in rural areas. So we have very good connectivity in the cities, but that's still a gap in the rural areas. Um, okay, I think Moses. Now we come to you. What are the most? What would you say are the most uh, pressing cyber policy and human rights issues? Why do you think they are the most progressive? The, the, what I would consider the most pressing issue is how to manage to be securing the space, securing the cyberspace, and ensure the dignity and the dignity of the user is put in, you know, is, is, is managed pretty well. Now, this, this has been issue for quite some time. It's not just about the internet, it's not just about cyber, it's not just all every other space uh, in effort to secure itself has all the issues of how far do you go uh, security to stop and whether it's human rights start or is it possible for both and how do you go about it? Now, if almost all conversations happening in Africa, the question is who has a decision? Who can make a call that this is a security issue, this is a human rights issue, and this is where we can demarcate? Now, Institutions from legislative to judicial oversight in terms of uh, you know um, warranties for interception of calls or interception of data. These, these these are some of the oversight structures that, that region, but legislations are somehow trying to either avoid it or um, it's not provided for in the constitution in one way or the other between the separation of power. We find that increasingly institutions are trying to wrote that kind of uh, oversight. So that to me is one of the most important cracks, the most, most important issue here. So um, maybe to examples, but uh, hopefully maybe some other people can also see, but then we can go into examples if needed. Again, you've also been in this area. What what do you consider uh, pressing policy and human rights issues? Can you hear me perfectly now? Yeah. Okay. Emila, please speak closer to your microphone. We we can't. Very yes, maybe other people can hear you. You just go on. Um, after being, uh, 
uh, I don't know what the problem is, but I'm really close my mic. And, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, but very faintly. Faintly. Could we have Benga and then we'll come back to you? If that's I, I just continue and then we'll get back to Emil. So uh, I think I think there's there's, there's data privacy uh, that is critical. And I say this because a lot of governments are beginning to gather data of citizens uh, in the name of uh, better services, in the name of, so for example, in telecommunications, you have people registering SIM cards uh, for census, you have all this, for banks, for you know, private institutions that are beginning to collect you know, uh, citizen data. And for many of the countries, there is the key question of data privacy. I mean, what happens if my data is, you know, managed? What happens if I'm mistaken, you know, for a terrorist? You know, the T word. What happens? I, do I do I get redressed? Um, how 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 is that how is that addressed? I think I think that's one key issue that we need to look at. The other uh, which would have been interesting is the fact that we offer a lot of copying uh, that happens from country to country. And see what has happened in, with the lands during this year. Uh, not even beginning with Uganda, but beginning with some other countries. You've seen countries beginning to copy. Uh, you can see Uganda. You can see Ghana. Uh, I mean, you, and you can tell. One of the things that I looked at over the last few weeks is which countries in Africa are hosting elections over the next few months. And one of you know, and and this is one way we can begin to work around you know, circumvention in advance because you know that if elections are holding in a state, there is a likelihood that a, you know, a, uh, you know, Gambia copies a, you know, or, or copies, you know, another company that shut down the internet during elections and we can, you know, we can be able to have some, you know, free and thoughtful advocacy around. And I think one, finally, one, one critical issue that I would love to see on the table, uh, which we're not seeing a lot yet right now in terms of you know, uh, business and human rights issues, is engagement. And I say engagement because I want to fall back on uh, one of the one of the things that Moses mentioned earlier. So we have we have silos, right? We have the security agencies thinking of security, security making the space. And we've got, you know, activists and suicide organizations and rights, you know, uh, people in another silo saying, no, we want privacy rights, we want privacy rights, we want privacy rights. And we need to begin to have a conversation. We will never find a balance. You know, I said before that it's like a rectangle and you draw a line in the middle. It's a very line across. We're to have times when we're going to have a lot more emphasis on security. Either just after, you know, a terrorist attack or something, but there are times when you need to move the slider a bit and say, you know what, privacy and rights are also important. And, and I'll give a very simple example of that. We've had, you know, uh, people, security agencies abusing Section 24 of the Cybercrime Law in Nigeria. And yes, we've gone to court to challenge that section of the law. Yes, we're proposing a counter bill on digital rights and freedom, but at the same time, we've now reached out to the Cyber Security Council and the Ministry of Justice and say, you know, Bring the security agents together under one roof, and we will train on the principles of, of you know digital rights, which would even be in their own interest. Because tomorrow they may not be in uniform, and they may become victims of the same laws that they've you know misinterpreted. So I think we need to have a lot more conversations between the silos uh, that see themselves as the community, and of course each one of the work that they do. Of course, you know what my bias. Yes, but definitely we need we need to begin to talk to each other a bit more to at least have some understanding. In cases where the talks fail, of course, and then know um, how to target the advocacy. But some of the security agencies that do the you know shut down and the arrest and things like that, some of them have not thought about the fact that tomorrow when they're either in uniform or in government, they will become victims of the kind of you know, uh, clamp downs that they are not promoting, and maybe that thought 
would help them at least change some of the things that they do. Benga, you've raised uh, um, you've raised uh, critical, um, especially misuse of data, and uh, we don't know. Uh, that's a question that uh, us in this uh, movement are, uh, you know, uh, in that sense. Then I want to find out and uh, ask Moses, somebody who's been researching a lot in this area. Um, do you think um, is the role of private companies when it comes to advocating for rights uh, respecting cyber policy? I think actually uh, private companies are some of the most important cogs in this whole ecosystem in trying to maintain cyber security itself. Uh, I mean, uh, information security, and also, uh, defending the rights of their clients. Now, I think even if we had perfect laws, would be guaranteed of our human rights if the people are actually holding the data themselves have not had a whole experience of using the values of you know, and the foundations of human rights. And I'm saying this uh, in. in, in of um, what we have seen uh, between, um, actually in the U.S., not necessarily here. Either. So when you saw Apple, uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> as to hand over the San Bernardino iPhone issue, and uh, you could see how the Department of Justice at least fought the case, and Apple fought it back. But actually a lot of people are asking is, sometimes we never hear of uh, Google taken to call to handle data, that it's so easy to get Android data, considering there are some of the leaders in, in terms of uh, how did the OS penetration, which is why Google has more users than Apple, but we only hear of this Apple case. And, and that is your thought. Probably the, the, the amount of things that are happening behind the back, and this actually was confirmed by Jordan during the leaks, that I hand over the day exploits, exploits before the even notify or patch so that the NSA or some of on. So I think uh, we, we cannot just. Oops. Someone just my call. We are in fiber court. Okay, what's it? Uh, private companies are, are, are better served by protecting citizen rights because citizen rights, citizens are the ones giving them the business. And on top of just the laws in terms of licensing and seeking clarity on how to go about uh, data access and databases, uh, interception, can we also have tech companies and private companies that deal or handle data? I think very clear about the role in ensuring that the technical is much um, supported. So I would, I, I'm looking at a company saying, okay, laws can work and laws help a lot, but we know that when you don't respect the laws, you also need to go a step further and then the technological uh, defense so that, you know, when we talk about VPNs, we are talking about encryption, we are talking about anonymity. All these things are embedded in the everyday practice and operational steps in you know, their business, every other day business, from banks to all these kind of things, uh, from data collection, from data processing, and from data storage. So that is one of the key roles for the private. Ensure push for better laws, but at the same time, push to ensure that technological defense systems are embedded in your everyday practice. Thank you. Um, um, maybe Eli, you can also chip in. Um, we think we have we have like best have models of engagement between the society and the private sector. Uh, that is in this in this topic. Of cyber.
Loudly? Yeah, that goes. Okay, I'll, I'll try to talk loudly. I think, yes, we do have some framework that we can use, like the African Declaration. Um, this is for uh, the companies, uh, you know, the typical companies, to, to really respect human rights to the fullest extent possible. And I think this is what Jose was, was saying. Uh, and, and where the uh, technical companies are sent to government violate human rights. Uh, they should uh, intercept uh, those who narrowly as possible and seek application um, of the scope and legal requirements. So, so I think uh, our call to these technical companies to respect, protect, and, and, and remedy, to apply that framework to fulfill their duties in. Um, Holding human rights on the internet. Wow, it's really strange to hear what you're saying, Ebola. Uh, you can do something about your mic or the voice level. Uh, do you want to add something, or uh, then I just move on to the next section? Inability to hear Emilia now is a practical demonstration of one of the critical issues that we have in terms of silencing the voices of civil citizens. I mean, it's, it's, this is what happens when people are on the table and, you know, their voices are literally muted uh, by governments who shut down. I mean, it, it was this one when I heard, like, oh my God, you know, uh, this, this is exactly what happens when it's difficult to, you know, get the other stakeholders uh, because, you know, muted. Uh, by governments. Uh, just nothing else to add. Just just to say that that's that's an interesting. So much. Uh, so far, so good. Um, now let's look at uh, the issue of cyber security in in Africa, as you know, as a whole. And what to say? You know, what did you say? Uh, you know how. Is, is cyber security different our context and cyber security manifests itself in Africa? And the definition, of course, I am asking that all of you have been working on this issue and knowing that uh, we have seen uh, different definitions. We have you with a definition, we have Isaka with another definition. So, you know, what would you say is the definition? And how cybersecurity manifested itself in Africa, and I want to take that first. When you look at uh, what the probably intent, document of intent being the African Union Convention, cybersecurity. I mean, it's not data processing. Uh, the the, the you find it uh, is really not unauthorized access to data systems. And by that, they mean not or from data from uh, But I think to, to I think the main lacking point for me uh, in most of these definitions that are also adopted by countries uh, include the, you know, conf um, confusion. Because that's a rather a condescending term, but I would say uh, cyber security with information security, or equating cyber security with information security, and that's a information security is a cyber security. There would be an, 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 at least wider definition, but not so wide as to lose meaning. Uh, the more we are in a position to incorporate the human element. Uh, the people are using the, the, the society, the community. That for me is important. However, I looked at uh, the Kenyan definition, uh, the security regulations that we have in Kenya under the uh, Kenya Information and Communication Amendment Act of 2013. And somehow it goes beyond just the information security. And I'm hoping probably other countries can also look into how they understand this because it's not just about the definition, it's also about. Um, until you define something, it calls into place like the objectives 
and who to contact us in place and the design uh, framework. So, yes, I think uh, likely seeing or more, more or less we're seeing information security being a part of cyber security, which unfortunately is not. All right. And uh, uh, one more before I go to Benga or Emila Moses. Uh, how is cyber security has manifested in itself? Manifesting itself. Uh, this conversation I always um, uh, with my kids in the office that when I'm reading any report or any uh, study that is being carried out around cybersecurity in Africa, it's so predictable that the first paragraph will include um, is the internet and computers have really helped us with us to do one, two, three. However, cybersecurity have taken so much and this is how much we are losing as a country and then it's quantified in terms of video. Go to Deloitte, uh, go to McKinsey, go to almost all kind of reports. They are always reporting up using the kind of um, team. I think the, the corporate clients in, in our theaters in the region have evidence in terms of keeping the agenda of how security is understood by government. And that, uh, by extension, the policy makers. Um, well, if you look keenly, even at reports that we find in the country, in country, you find rarely do you hear of people they say I lose like ten dollars uh, through camp. Uh, that will probably never ever find its way into those reports. For being reported is oh, please much money to this kind of hackers. Or oh, this money was lost to an insurance fraud. Cyber, 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 cyber crime. Now, now, when crime increasingly is only defined or only circumscribed within the business world, then what you're losing out is the agency and the place of the city themselves who are losing in small amounts of money that accumulates into all this money. But something important the loss of confidence in engaging with cyberspace. Uh, it, you know, it just affects even like there are small businesses. You don't even want to have your business online because not sure whether you can, you know, uh, you will lose money or lose all savings. So it's important that uh, the, the, the manifestation of cyber security uh, moving from me to move from the business world or the business definition to add the whole approach of cyber security, which incorporates even the citizens or the human agents. Okay, thank you. I think you have uh, responded in a comprehensive. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, you know, look at the issue of cyber security. It's it's really it's a topic, and uh, like you know, we are seeing different uh, issues emerging into cyber security. So, what? Areas or what are let us let us just say what are the main areas that we should focus on uh, African context and I think we have missed Emila's voice. Emila, are you there now? Now I hope you can hear me. Now. <laughs> yes, I think uh, there were some uh, dark forces out there who were trying to to ensure that I don't uh, use my voice on the issues that we need to focus on base, I think we can even go back to the question that you were asking now about the definition as civil society and human rights defenders. To be able to engage meaningfully, we, we need to, to, you know, like to understand what cyber security means. It is currently, it's so broad. Um, and in the end, it, you know, it confuses not just civil society but all, all the different uh, uh, sectors within uh, civil society. Cyber security, unfortunately, has come to mean like a huge spectrum of things, um, and not just this lead to to powers um, that that really broad in application, but it also generating um, a consensus that is real in the civil society space in the human uh, within the human rights defenders uh, uh, 
also think one of the issues that we need to talk to tied to the definition is this uh, logical speak and fear mongering. Um, I think we, whenever we talk about cyber security, we 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 talk. I don't. People present it in such a way that it is, um, you know, you have to fear, you have to be afraid. Uh, and cyber security can actually be very complex particularly to those uh, who do not have technical background. So I think it's something that we need, sounds basic, but I think it's something that we need to um, to, to look at uh, as a civil society, uh, also as human rights defenders. Thank you. Benga, do you want to add something? just add one word and that word is terrorism um, th that unfortunately is almost central to the conversation around cybersecurity in Africa it is what many governments used to create the climate of fear because many times when you talk about citizen rights the response you get is if you have nothing to hide why are you afraid why are you asking us to not, not have this you know complex conversation about cybersecurity are you siding with a terrorist think of that Many times we need to step away from the state of fear to be able to sensibly engage uh, with cybersecurity issues and, and take away the you know emotions and fear of the world terrorism. Just to add that to Emela and Moses. I would like to go back to Moses because I know he has uh, been conducting a lot of research. Uh, uh, on this topic, both uh, nationally, really, and even um, at, at the African level. And Moses, um, I think that question um, you would actually, out of your experience and out of the research that you have been conducting, what should be our focus? Um, I think yeah, I think we talked about being too narrow and avoiding to, you know, the whole idea of just being all place. But I think it's very important that uh, all security in itself, like you yourself, the way you use your computer, the way you use uh, your phone to connect and do all these manner of things, that is the basic digital security. It's very important in time to turn to the whole net from the technical perspective. And, and I think uh, cyber security being looked at from a perspective has on that point. So I think it's for me, instead of just focusing on, oh, the government is not doing enough, or the government is doing too much, there's too much law and all, uh, focus on how to empower that person who is using the internet, the integration with the internet. That, for me, is where it should start. That should define uh, all the way how the policies are made. And because in, in increasingly people themselves will you know, learn how to integrate and how to ask the right questions, how to say, actually, this is not terrorism. When I'm encrypting my emails, it's not about encrypting. It's not about, I'm not doing anything. It's just my space. I'm in my space. So that, for me, is very important. Okay, I don't know whether you meant the whole idea of what specific policy you should focus on, but I felt in my understanding and uh, we look around almost everything that is being done, you're being told we are security in you, but you don't even know what you need to Almost all reports, almost all findings show that the biggest, the weakest link in all this system is actually agency, empowering the human agency. How can you talk about security that you are the one to, to make the decisions on which websites to close or who, who to go to jail because they have violated all these kind of things? And yet, even with the elephant, so let's focus on human. I mean, the, the basic digital security, and then we can move from there. That for me is one of the most important aspects. Uh, and I, I'll come, I come back to the issue that Benga raised, and I, the, 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 that's because it's an issue that uh, that affects the country that I live the whole region. That uh, it has been, uh, it's been proven that uh, groups like Al-Shabaab using you know the internet to recruit uh, to recruit uh, new people into the movement and even to communicate and end up committing atrocities. That is a concern for us. But 
question is how do we address this is just one example there are many other examples so how do we address this whole cyber crime is that we don't undermine human rights Benga? okay so this this is one of the conversations we've had you know uh in, in Nigeria and other countries over the last few months. So this is this is very practical. It's an opportunity for governments to enter, an opportunity for governments to hide behind you know a law or policy for their own intentions to clamp down or you know just over serial security agencies taking advantage of you know vague provisions in cybercrime laws to please their boats or guards as, as we call them. There are three key things. One is if it's in a stage where it's not yet not, the opportunity to take a critical look uh, at the various sections that could compromise and the way they compromise, um, mostly in terms of language. There is there is exactly uh, a cybercrime law that says that if you speak mine, we will arrest you and put you in jail for three days. Mm-hmm. Usually, it says that Sorry. if you say something that causes political disturbance or that goes against national security. And that's where the problem is, is that phrase national security can mean anything from insulting my mother to, you know, being the presidential palace or things like that. So there's, there's an opportunity, if it's not yet law, to engage and, and ask for a review. Uh, but if it's already law, which is the case in many countries, I think, you know, what, what would need to be done um, is to first it's basically challenge these laws. I mean, that, that has to be done. In terms of speaking to rights, we have to challenge these laws in court. Uh, the countries where there are new cyber crime laws that are not friendly to rights, many of those countries already have constitutions that have a provision uh, for rights. So we can challenge this, you know, these laws uh, with the background of the of the constitution. And the other thing to do is also to begin to look at, you know, countering positive policies. So in many of those countries. Uh, into there and many other countries across the continent, there are scenarios where uh, you have those provisions in cybercrime laws that are already laws, right? So there's nothing you can do about them. But what you can do is to draft. So in Nigeria, we've drafted something called the Digital Rights and Freedom Bill. Uh, and it's a positive rights legislation, and it looks specifically to the rights of citizens, and it makes it law. And, and the proposal is to say that regardless of existing provisions in any law, uh, this law, once it's passed, then it supersedes what was negative and, you know, conforms to what the constitution says in terms of in terms of rights. So I think that's a uh, that's one way uh, to engage in terms of human rights. But the, the problem is that a conversation many times um, has to be advocacy, not just engagement, because it's already become a law. If it's not yet a law, then we have an opportunity uh, to fight uh, to make sure that it's very balanced. Thanks, Benga. I think I'm to Emila. Uh, what what's your view uh, on this issue of uh, um, just being between law and uh, not human rights? Uh, I think um, civil society we are just bystanders, and we we tend to to from the sidelines um, and, and not be in involved actively in the discussion on, on cyber security. So it's important for us to to realize, like I was writing in the chat, to realize that um, our, our human rights online or like our online freedom is perishable. It's, no one can give up on a platter. We have to do it. We have to fight for it. Um, and, and also be on the table uh, where to um, relate to cyber security, we are involved. We 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 have input uh, and knowledgeably input into the discussions that are that are being done. So I just think when we look at other people. We have to look at the woman in the, uh, and and um, you know it was so a task on on, on the discussion uh, that happened on policy development and all the other. Things that are related to cyber uh, The need 
need for us to uh, participate in all these debates and to also push some space on that table. Uh, because, you know, there are all these cybercrime laws that are being proposed and some uh, have already been passed in the region. We need to start participating in that. Uh, just a quick one. Says, is there anything like um, anything like we are being organized? Because I there has been some talk about uh, some of those uh, that, you know, some of the proposals of cyber law can actually be found in already other existing laws. Just quick tell us. Uh, is there like a yeah, regulation? Yeah, yeah. No. No, I think so. I think so. And I think I'll use just my, my country, Kenya, where we have in the last two years, we have had five proposed laws or bills or regulations that somehow seek to manage this space. So, um, this having a, a study within the communication authority law that actually stipulates you know, some of these basic things. And the problem you see here is uh, different departments. Uh, to respond as much as they can to this overblown, or I don't know if it's <laughs> maybe that's my, my my take, but there's so much response from government in a very uncoordinated manner. You end up having so many laws that are so all over the place, and 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 you feel like cyber security was that last from an security perspective. Is that one law would be enough to manage all the others. You know, one to rule them all. So for me, there is a legislation, and probably this is more likely than not as a result of the and actually what cyber security and what of government, what's the role of the private sector, and where citizens are in, in all these ecosystems. So thanks. Thank you. That's a, that's a very great response. Uh, we are almost ending, but uh, we would like to just out of the your views, the three of you. I think we we have an opportunity, uh, say civil society, uh, to push against trends of surveillance and uh, censorship in Africa. Uh, who wants to go first? Okay. I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, if we do not want to become endangered uh, species, then we need we need to push back. And the reason I say this is that the road to hell, they say, is paved with good intentions. Unfortunately, uh, it's one of the things that you know I mentioned earlier. Governments are copying each other, and one of the things that we can see is that when one country is able to do something, um, it's like you know the president says to each other, "Oh, my friend." Able to arrest people and nobody spoke up. Let me try my own country. This because if we're not careful, I mean, we some countries, and I can think North Korea, for example, and it says, Oh my god, we wouldn't want to be like North Korea. But North Korea doesn't happen in one day, it happens as it, it happens as a piece of things. Somebody gets arrested, everyone looks away and says, It's not me. Uh, the next person gets picked up, and everyone says, Well, maybe it's just a fight, maybe it's related to a terrorist or something like that. And at the end of the day, before you know it, the structures are so weak that nobody to respond. So I think that if there's any time to begin to have digital rights advocacy in our continent, it's about now that we're beginning to see a trend. I mean, look at a very good example of Ghana, where some you know interesting police chief saw what happened in Uganda and said, oh, Charlie, we're going to do the same thing in Ghana in December. And because civil society and various actors spoke up and said, wait a second, you're not about to do this, are you? Uh, this is a stupid thing to do. Because of that, the president made a statement to say there is no plan to shut down the internet in, Ghana in, 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 you know, in December. So I think it's important. They say that it's the price for liberty. You know, you need to even do more than internal vigilance when it comes to fragile liberty. I think what we have across the continent is fragile liberty. Many, many political leaders will do anything to hold on to power, including getting people arrested for speaking their mind. I'll give very simple examples. Um, we've had scenarios in Nigeria where um, somebody who is in opposition or somebody who is trying to become president takes advantage of a of a movement. Uh, in 2012, for example, there was this whole 
they never got a finite pair. And the phone was quite pressing at the time. He blocked Jonathan because, you know, those protests became president. And when he became president, he then turned and said, oh my God, you guys are political, you're the devil. The same thing is beginning to happen about, about now. Uh, you have the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which was very helpful to the emergence of the current president as the president of Nigeria. And now, the same party APC is turning around to say, oh, Bring Back Our Girls is a political campaign, things like that. So, governments will always, always be afraid of people. And if they're doing it, what they will do is try as much as possible to, cl to clamp down. So we don't have a choice. This is not even a question of can we. It's a question of if we don't, we die. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, any of the two speakers, do you want to add on to that? Something around it. You feel policy uh, and laws themselves that need that to defend the citizens should at the same time work hand in hand with technical defense systems so that human defense themselves it, it can make it so for government to either censor information, surveil them, and when this is adopted on a mass level, you have the whole change in paradigm because uh, if, if say a country is shutting down the internet and then has managed to get back through suspension systems. You have to think beyond like just shutting down that you have to see. Actually, this is a zero sum game. I need to talk to the people. We need to realize that you cannot just simply shut the internet and keep people away. By the way, this whole idea of uh, control, censorship, and all these manner of things, it, it, if you mirror it in the technical realm, when the internet detects censorship, it is it, a it, is a broken system and it tries to circumvent around it. If we can increasingly adopt different mechanisms, anti surveillance, circumvent tools, use image tools like code, use signal, use the WhatsApp, all these manual things that are end to end encryption, make it so hard for them, even with their bad laws, to, to surveil you or to control the information that you're consuming. That for me is a sure way. But unfortunately, current what we have uh, people, the people who actually use encryption or end to end uh, systems, I just, you know, if you feel that they are actually picked out from a whole population because, oh, you're the only guy in your office who uses, say, like PGP encryption, what could it be that you guys are sending? And so it's, you have made it so easy for them to narrow down on you. Adopted them from an institutional perspective, say a university or on the nation, say every must use encryption. That way, you so hard for any policy or any government that would want to come and you know surveil you or read your messages or emails or whatever. And 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 increasingly, you you, you will realize that actually we can do about it, and then they move on to something else that probably. Uh, liberative and, and people can stand up in, in all this. At the moment, we leave it to just a few people, it becomes so hard even for those people who are using it. Um, discussion here, I think you will all agree with me that um, very uh, pertinent issues have been raised. However, in the interest of time, and I will give the, uh, each of our three uh, speakers. Um, an opportunity to give closing remarks. But in your closing remarks, I would like you to talk to us or speak to us about what are the next steps for engagement. Uh, could also provide us with us the best, you know, examples of best practice, examples uh, of good policies or successful campaigns and advocacy uh, that have gained results. And I think uh, I want to start with Ben. Okay, so uh, three things. Number one is platform. Uh, number two is best practices. And number three is research-based advocacy. When I say platform, I mean that um, we, we now have uh, you know, an opportunity for conversation. Uh, initially, we used to all meet at the site meetings at the uh, You have to look for funding to go to Brazil, and then you have one small African meeting on the side, but thankfully we now have the Internet Freedom Forum that is 
by, by pain, and you have the Forum on Internet Freedom in Africa that is hosted by CPESA. Thankfully, uh, different hours of the year, so ours is, you know, April, and this is in September. So we have a platform of, opportunity, platform, uh, of engagement where we can, you know, uh, exchange, you know, have conversations and do the things that we need to do. Uh, the second is in terms of best practices. I think that we have so many, um, you know, things being done by people at the moment that we can learn from, um, you know, all the way from the legal, uh, you know, plan uh, of action on where we have, you know, for example, this, this document, I can declare on internet rights, that's an example. Uh, one document that we can all buy into as a best practice. We can have some regional, you know, opportunities where people can exchange, you know, what they've also done. You know, we have examples of what happened in Uganda uh, when the internet was shut down. Our society was able to mobilize to make sure that even people, people were cut off uh, from the internet, they were still get back online. So I think we need to share this best practice stories some more. Uh, thankfully, uh, the platforms that I talked about earlier an opportunity for us to have these conversations uh, from time to time of best practices. Uh, but the uh, thing I want to say is in terms of research-based advocacy or fact-based advocacy, many times and security agencies shut down because they think advocates are emotional people who have no data and doesn't help if their narrative is right. Um, I think we need to continue uh, with efforts, but I think it's very important for all to also make sure that it's data-driven. Uh, a very simple example, we're going to court right now on the cybercrime law in Nigeria, and we basically uh, said to, you know, uh, you know, various stakeholders that seven people, seven bloggers have been arrested because of law. Arguments from the Ministry of Justice and from some media people and saying, you know, there's no proof. But we went to a meeting, put the data on the table, and guess what? You can never argue with data. And so it became a lot more useful, uh, and now we're going to have an opportunity to actually bring security agencies because we're able to put data on the table. Yes, we've got platforms of engagement, uh, IFF, FIFA, and of course, I'm sure that there'll be you know, more uh, opportunities. Uh, we've got best practices that we need to keep exchanging you know, with each other. We released uh, a report earlier in the year on the civilian freedom. I would love to see a lot more organizations release more reports and the special release. You know, Stratman is always doing research and the people and others are always asking, of course, always writing reports. Uh, but we need to see a lot more because the, the third you know, point of data driven advocacy cannot happen if it isn't done and if data is not codified uh, in many of those reports. I think. And I know Moses is smiling uh, because you know that is what he did for. And like you say, most of us are actually uh, evidence-based advocacy, and that only happen through if we have the data. Emila, great. Um, I think being um, we arrive some of the next steps, but I, 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 what I would want to emphasize is that um, as society, as human rights defenders, uh, we need to realize that, that cybersecurity is important uh, for, the, for, for the exercise of our rights, both online and offline. Uh, and it is also key to our privacy and protection of personal data. So so it's not just talk for for the hairs in, in jeans and, and t-shirts, uh, but it's something very important. For, for. On in terms of best practice and uh, tools that we can use, I would uh, go for self promotion and talk about the African Declaration on Internet Rights and uh, and, um, and it's connect with with global partners, with Kicktanet, with PIN, uh, with you know with with a lot of uh, civil society actors, and uh, I think it gives you know. It, how to develop policy around um, when issues cyber security, uh, and it's not we don't want it to start a, a digital you know death or digital living. It's a living document, and there are opportunities to engage with it. Uh, and if there are best practices, uh, even 
an interactive website that we can all um, input into. So I, I think um, that will be my, my call. For me. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Global Partners. Uh, to close it for us. Of personal defense systems, so we can all start encrypting whenever possible. That would be a good thing. Two, I think there are great minds in government policy circles. We should not just brand everyone in government as retrogressive or conservative. I think those are people we need to start engaging with because we have time for people who have evidence and who have uh, some sense in whatever they are saying. So the point couples with what Benga said about data-driven advocacy and partnership with people in government who understand these things, I think we're headed in the right direction. But also, <laughs> it's fashion in trying to self-promote. I have shared on the chat with everyone uh, a tool that we use here in Kenya uh, to to ICTPC uh, formulation in the next uh, few that will get Kenya for the next few years. There was a component around cybersecurity and people actively participated, commenting on specific lines, specific words, and that for us, I mean, it's an open source. If you feel that it's something you would want to incorporate in your country, uh, feel free to contact me. We can see how we can do that because uh, it's available on GitHub. So yeah, we call it Jelly, and uh, thank you very much for everyone who turned up and tweeted or did something uh, for the content. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I would like to wind this up by saying that we are very grateful to to Emma, to ben, uh, to Moses, and Global Partners for putting this together. Aditi, uh, you've done a lot of work, you and Daniela. Thank you, and all the participants for having you know, time to participate. And like I started uh, when when we started this webinar, I still emphasize that this is a chance provided for you, you know, just a glimpse to gaining clarity on the key issues and, and, and needs for engagement, uh, as outlined in that African video that uh, we already produced. Um, we hope that uh, you will uh, cyber security in Africa uh, and that, you know, you will remember that we need to balance between cyber security and rights. So thank you very much, and uh, see you somewhere soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.